Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining our ninth Gateway College Lecture Series for 2021. We greatly appreciate your support and interest in contributing to the knowledge economy. My name is Paul Tufts, and I'm on the Board of Directors here at Gateway Center of Excellence in Rural Health. Gateway's office is in Goddard, Ontario, and is the only research institute in Canada. It is governed by community-based volunteers who aim to advance rural health teaching and, and research across Huron, Perth, Gray, and Bruce counties. Our mission is to improve the health and quality of life for rural residents through research, education, and communication. Beginning in February of this year, Gateway launched its first virtual lecture series. With social isolation being at the top of mind as COVID-19 restrictions continued to heighten, there was no better time to launch this initiative. Through this lecture series, our hope is to cultivate a culture of rural health knowledge and innovation while virtually connecting communities to reduce social isolation. Just as a reminder, for those of you that have joined us for all four of our fall lectures, you will be receiving a gateway certificate in recognition of your interest and commitment. Congratulations. Today's discussion leader is Leif Deacon, who is a research chair with Gateway in Rural Resiliency. When Leif is not volunteering with Gateway, he is working at his regular job as an associate professor with the School of Environmental Design and Rural Development at the University of Guelph. Today, Leith will be leading the discussion entitled COVID-19 and the Importance of Local Data, a Case for Small and Rural Communities in Ontario. Joining Leith in this discussion are today's panelists. Please welcome Joelle Laporte-Lewis, Director in Social Research Planning Council, and Ben Lobb, Member of Parliament for Huron and Bruce Counties. Leith, Joelle, and Ben, Thank you so much for joining us today. And now Leif, over to you to begin your discussion. Thanks so much, Paul. Um, and thanks, Joelle, and thanks, Ben, for being here. Ben, nice to meet you. We didn't have a chance to meet each other before this started, so uh, thanks so much for participating. Uh, I'm gonna talk for the next uh, 30 minutes or so about the value of collecting local data. I'll just share my screen while that's happening. Uh, about the value of collecting local data. And I know that for many of you uh, on the call, you've heard me speak about this topic before, but I, I'm gonna do it again today. Uh, I feel very strongly that when policies and programs or support mechanisms are designed and implemented, they should be based in data that was rigorously collected from a local community. I believe that it's imperative that local residents are able to see themselves in the policy decisions that impact them. And I feel that the best way to make sure that this is possible is to work directly with local residents. Ask them what is important, ask them what matters, and what do they believe should be done. I'd like to make it clear that I am in no way advocating that the general public should get to make the decisions, but rather their experiences, their ideas should be taken into account when experts, when policymakers start to make decisions. By ensuring that the public is able to see themselves and their realities reflected back to them in policy will help increase buy-in, it helps increase the success of any particular policy, and of course it increases the impact of the said policy. So today's topic is, as Paul mentioned, COVID-19 and the importance of local data, a case from small and rural communities in Ontario. I typically don't offer a presentation overview, but today I am jumping around a little bit, so I thought it might be helpful. I'm gonna start by reviewing the mission of Gateway to make sure that everyone on the call today is aware of the important work that this organization leads. I'm then going to get into why local data matters, move to an explanation or a justification of the focus on small and rural communities, and then introduce a project that is being led currently out of Gateway to enforce the importance of local data, and then spend the remainder of the time talking about a large project that I'm the lead on that has collected a very, very large amount of local data. So, I'm going to start with the Gateway mission. As you can see on the screen, the mission of Gateway is to improve the health and the quality of life of rural residents through research, education, and communication. And as Paul mentioned, it focuses on the four uh, counties of Perth, Huron, Bruce, and Gray. It is a very unique research institution 
uh, that leads in several initiatives. Currently, there are eight on the go, and they have massive ranges from frontline workers, impacts of COVID on Syrian refugees, connectedness and coaching, uh, and so forth. And it covers and collects a broad amount of data and really works hard to mobilize that data to get it back into the hands of people who can utilize it. So going from that point forward, I think many of us have heard this saying, and I know I saw Wayne Caldwell on, on the call, and I know I've heard him actually say this, if you've been to one rural place, you've been to one rural place. And I, I find this kind of a nice, a nice quote, but I particularly don't subscribe to it. There are commonalities between rural places, but there are also local nuances. Rural is not a monolith. Rural is not only agriculture, but also so much more. Farming is important, but so are all those small artesian shops, the butchers, the plumbers, and of course the rural schools. And we as rural Canadians need to have our voices heard. And the best way to get that voice out there is through the collection of reliable, valid data. We need to ensure that our opinions are heard and relevant in this process legitimizes our concerns by engaging with local populations. Therefore, there is an increased sense of buy in from the community that might be impacted. I keep saying we because I myself was brought up outside of North Bay, Ontario in a town with a general store, and I now live in uh, Wellington County. So I'm born and raised in rural. So that's why I feel super comfortable saying we. So in the last five minutes, I've said the word, the word rural, which is a tough word to say, more times than you might hear over the course of a week. So why rural? Ultimately, it's because rural places and the small communities around them have been neglected. This neglect is a symptom of politics. It's a symptom of voting seats and of population distribution. Approximately 82% of Canadians live in non-rural locations. That is that leaves about eight and a half million of us that live outside that live in rural places that's more than the entire population of the greater toronto area that being said the vast majority of policy decisions are based on the experiences of the other 82 percent and i for one think it's critical that everyone should be able to see themselves in policy not simply the people from toronto london or waterloo why is this important because rural places are different not because they're better not because they're special because they are different our demographics are different. Often we have a greater percentage of older residents. So ideas around topics like mobility are critical. We're isolated digitally. We lack broadband service. We lack medical specialists and of course, physically. COVID has brought attention to the implications of these factors on the mental health of all Canadians, but the experience of rural Canadians is unique and requires a different response. The other reason that rural should matter and it does matter is because of economics. Rural Canada contributes a significant per, uh, percentage to Canada's GDP. Think of resource extraction, think of forestry, hydroelectric generation. Most of this occurs in rural places, and that's without mentioning agriculture. I imagine I'm preaching to the choir here, but the impacts of ag and ag food on Ontario's economy cannot be understated. Nearly 800,000 jobs are related to the agricultural value chain and nearly $40 billion in GDP contribution. As you can see, nearly 50,000 farms, the vast majority of which are family owned, are, are, uh, exist in this, this chain, as well as 4,100 business locations and over 15,000 retail stores. The impacts of ag are critical, not only for rural Ontario, but rural Canada more generally. The first project I want to quickly highlight has received funding from the Ontario government and is being led out of gateway. The goal of this study is to strengthen Huron Perth rural communities by ensuring that the voices of local employers and their employees are heard and reflected in potential solution generation. We've designed a mixed methods research project to gather data from all employees and employers across Huron and Perth. Currently, a quantitative survey is open that is gathering individual data on mental health. We are asking questions about individual well-being and importantly, what services, both formal and informal, uh, individuals are accessing. We are attempting to gather information that can be used to inform policy decisions about what services are appropriate for residents from small and rural communities and what supports are wanted. What, currently, what current services are or are not working? We are then going to launch a series of interview focus groups to glean contextual details about the specifics to add further information about what is impacting the decision making process. 
Ultimately, we are going to provide some really important local data that will be shared widely with the Ministry of Labor, other relevant audiences that can improve the resiliency of our communities. This is an example of how Gateway works directly with the communities that they serve to try to gather as much relevant information and turn it into important policy decisions. The second project that I want to highlight and spend the rest of the time talking about is the Rural Response to COVID project uh, that I've been leading. Today, I'm going to pull data that has uh, been collected from Perth and Huron counties, and I'll talk about the expansion in a little bit. But the goal of this project was to explore the experiences of resident, the experience of residents from across rural and small communities within Ontario. In consultation with the research team and an advisory group, five objectives, which you can see there on your screen, were developed. It's critical to note that on the advisory team, local residents were representatives. Uh, folks from the NGO sector, local government spokespersons, local health units, local businesses. And additionally, I personally reached out to as many uh, organizations that would take my call, social services, Ontario Works, immigration groups, economic development, agricultural groups, and so forth. The idea was to ensure that these objectives resonated with the case study areas and made sure they, uh, they reflected what uh, the communities needed. Again, like many of you know, the impacts of COVID on ag and ag food has been significant. We've had significant labor shortages, support requests from government and a very significant loss in sales. And while the economic impacts are obvious, a loss of $2.9 billion in sales, the impacts on individuals, on families cannot be ignored. There has been a very significant and reported massive in, uh, increase in anxiety uh, related to the ongoing COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic. And as these headlines and article titles reveal, mental health across rural Ontario is something that has starting to gain some traction. There's a recognized need to provide support for this group of people to require mental health training in order to access benefits, much like something like training uh, to use pesticides and herbicides. There is a recognized need to ensure that mental health concerns are no longer swept under a uh, proverbial carpet. So what I'm going to do today is present some of the data that has been collected from the COVID-19 survey. The survey had five focus areas. The first was demographics. I wanted to be able to present data to a social service agency, for example, that focused on food security about the experiences of self-identifying females under the age of 30 who make less than $40,000 per year, who work in service industry and who rent their homes. I wanted that level of granularity. The second section, uh, second section pulled from the Canadian Index of Well-Being, indicators such as physical and mental health, finances, personal safety, among others. Um, for example, oh, sorry, among others, the third phase was social behavior, how we move and how we shop. For example, Stratford is a community that is heavily reliant uh, on, on the festival and tourists. COVID has changed our movement to critical that relevant, reliable economic data is collected and shared with various Chamber of Commerce, economic development departments to enable proper support to be identified. The fourth section is day-to-day -day living. This is essentially all about anxiety. What are residents concerned about? Personal health, finances, their ability to keep food and medications in the house, and so forth. And then the final section is planning and preparation. What are we doing in terms of emergency planning? There's no need to duplicate something if it's already been done. I asked each of these sections twice. The first, I asked people to reflect on life prior to the start of the pandemic to create a baseline and then how things have changed. We're trying to paint a picture of how things have been impacted by COVID and how things might look in the future. Each survey had over 120 questions and we received just under 3,600 completed surveys uh, from Perth and Huron counties. Getting into some of the overviews in terms of who participated, the largest single act, uh, age bracket is there on your screen, and that is between 60 and 67 years of age. The thing that matters here is this is nearly identical to the age brackets according to stats can for the region. This is really great because it adds critical legitimacy to our data. One of the most important areas that rural places differ from from their urban counterparts is where people work. While healthcare and social services are the largest, uh, sectoral employment, agriculture is the second highest, as you can see there on your screen. Ag isn't so much of a job as it is a vocation. Individuals in this uh, sector cannot simply close the, born, uh, the barn door at the end of the day, so to speak. There's a need to recognize that their workday is much different than that of someone in an office tower from Waterloo or Toronto or London. 
services that support these individuals must reflect that critical reality. Now let's get into some of the data. As I mentioned, participants were asked to assess their well-being using the CIW indicators. Here are the responses prior to the pandemic and here are the responses after. These are before and these are after. No numbers, just trends. Anyone can see that the increase in the values on the right, these are the bad values. The high columns in the far right are reflective of those who are retired. So there was a question about retirement satisfaction as well as employment satisfaction. You can assume those are the people that said uh, it doesn't uh, impact them. Sorry, there we go. Now we're going to get into mental health. This is showing the self-assessed mental health of respondents before and after the start of the pandemic. What you can see is a significant decrease in mental health, more specifically, 45% decrease in participants who indicated they had excellent mental health after the start of the pandemic. There was a 32% increase in participants who indicated uh, since the start of the pandemic, their mental health was average. A 57% increase in participants who, since the start of the pandemic, said they now have satisfactory mental health. And a remarkable 78% increase in participants who reported poor mental health since the start of the pandemic. As many of you understand, sex is one of, if not the most, indicators of vulnerability. Women simply are more precariously employed. They are more responsible for home and childcare, and generally they are paid less than their male counterparts. This slide is illustrating the difference in self-reported mental health by sex. There was a 42% decrease in self-identifying females who indicated excellent mental health since the start of the pandemic. This coincides with a 5% decrease in uh, males in the same category. So 42% decrease for self-identifying females in that excellent category, a 5% decrease for self-identifying males in that category. So a very, very significant difference right there. On the other side, uh, not as stark differences, a 68% increase in females who indicated satisfactory uh, for females, a 70% increase for males, and then all the way to the far right, uh, a 71% increase in males compared to a 67% increase in poor for females. What this slide is illustrating is the relationship between income and mental health. Perhaps unsurprisingly, there was a stronger relationship between those in lower income brackets and an increase in participants who indicated poor mental health. What I do want to mention that while it was a stronger relationship, there was a statistically significant relationship in all income brackets. Everyone was impacted by COVID and we're unable to say at this point uh, with certainty the impact that income has played without conducting further, further uh, interviews and focus groups. What you're looking at now is an illustration of the relationship between uh, sex, mental health and income. I don't have time to tease out all of the information, but what you're looking at here is female data. Uh, it's not statistically significant, but it is still a factor. The data on this slide shows the relationship with poor mental health and low income and an increased impact uh, from the pandemic based on sex. And we can hypothesize this is related to that previously mentioned precarious employment, low wages, increased uh, duties at home around kids specifically. Perhaps many of the respondents have either been furloughed or lost their job altogether. Again, this would be all covered in uh, subsequent interviews. Now let's go over to age a little bit. While we originally thought this might be super significant, it was mostly just interesting, but I do have a caveat that I'd like to talk about here. We'd like to ask some qualitative descriptive questions to add more detail about this, but what you're seeing is that regardless of age, mental health has been impacted. Some takeaways though, were that the most significant relationship was in uh, individuals in that younger age bracket. 18 to 29 uh, expressed a 71% decrease in that excellent mental health category since the start of the pandemic. On the, fl on the flip side, the same cohort, 18 to 29, an 80% increase in self-assessed poor mental health. So what we're really interested in is teasing this out more. And as many as you know, this group in all likelihood is either still in school, on employed, underemployed, maybe they bought their first home or they have new families. There's a myriad of factors that lead to a sense of instability often within this stage of life. And what we're trying to get to is that there is a need for policy, uh, those that develop policy to recognize this. The mental health supports that impact in our best for a younger Canadian are not what is going to work for an older Canadian. 
Just to highlight some of the previous data, specifically just by one sex, what you see here is females. So if I go just between the 18 and 29 age category for females, it is a 95% decrease in females between the age of 18 to 29 who self-assess their uh, mental health is excellent since the start of the pandemic. All I wanna do there is really illustrate the impact for that particular group, especially when you layer it on with sex. And what I've done here is bring attention to one particular category, 18 to 39. Over the last 18 months, there's been a real effort by all levels of government to bring attention to the impact of COVID-19 on older Canadians, 65 plus in particular. And I think according to the data that we've collected, there's a need to highlight the impact of COVID on younger Canadians, particularly 40 and under. What you're seeing is a nearly a 76% decrease in respondents who self-reported their mental health is excellent since the start of the pandemic. 50% uh, decrease in individuals who responded their mental health is good. And then moving to the other side, a 60% increase in individuals who self-reported their mental health is satisfactory. And nearly an 87% increase in individuals, females between the age of 18 to 39, who now say they have poor mental health. It's critical that when plans and pro programs are designed, local data is used to ensure that they are trying to achieve uh, what they set out to do. What you're seeing here is just a headline, headlines that have been collected of how some of this data has been used. Uh, obviously, as was mentioned, I work at the University of Guelph, so one of my biggest deliverables is peer-reviewed journal articles. I realize that they're not a big seller, uh, in fact, the data is better if it gets back to the community. So I work really hard on knowledge mobilization so that if there is a nonprofit, for example, that needs some data that supports their feeling that they've experienced increased ambulatory, they, there's an increased need for ambulatory care, let's make sure that data can be used to advocate for that. So that's just a sample of how we're using some of the data. I've also uh, published a series of reports that have been uh, widely circulated by the United Way. So far, there's been three. Uh, you can see the titles there, but mental health, gender, housing and homelessness, and then there's an economics one that is due, I think, this week. And then we'll have a much larger report kind of bringing it all together and then putting the data from Huron and Perth within the larger project. I've also had a number of infographics out because I think it's really important for researchers to recognize that not everybody digests information the same way. Uh, by putting, uh, by hiring a graphic designer, I, I mean, this is not my skill set, but they can work to understand how numbers, quantitative data can be used in effective ways. So we've created these infographics that, again, are all uh, able to be shared on social media, all networks, just to try to get the data back out to the communities where the data was collected from. And then I've given, I have no idea, I say 35 uh, presentations, but I give a ton of presentations and talks. They vary from kind of larger institutions like the Rural Ontario Institute, all the way to, I gave one to a local high school. Uh, I give radio station interviews. I taught uh, one lecture here at the university on disasters as well as uh, the station so forth. Again, any medium possible to get the information back out. And then what has happened since this original pilot study has been uh, uh, started in Perth and Huron, I received 230,000 from the Ontario government to expand. Seven additional counties have been hit uh, in terms of data collection. And I'm just gonna play this little video here on the side. That's a group of students trying to go through the data that has come in. We've received 23,000 completed surveys so far. I went back today to pick up more mail and they told me that I'm well over 25,000 completed surveys. We are in the middle of data entry and analysis and the implications for rural Ontario planning and programming are very significant. At this rate of data collection and this sheer volume of data, we can start to develop predictive modeling that can be used uh, to, to influence or should be used to influence policies and plans in all rural communities across Ontario. And then there are lots of questions about the role of the federal government in terms of expansion further. Oops, I don't that again. Obviously, it's been a large project. So I've listed just some of the key people here, the original advisory committee, as well as my contact information. And then I think I've got everybody that has provided any sort of funding to this project. A project like this started, or this project in particular, started with $10,000 from the University of Guelph. I have no idea what our budget total is at this point, but we're well 
uh, on the other side of 400,000. Uh, it's gone very, very well, but without out, uh, the community partners, none of this would have been possible. So that is where I'll end my formal presentation. Um, and I will start with some panel discussion if that works for everybody. Uh, Joelle and Ben, if you want to turn your cameras back on. So I, the reason I asked Joelle and Ben to be here today is because of the position that they currently hold. Joelle works for the uh, SRPC, which is affiliated with United Way in Perth Huron, a very local uh, nonprofit that uses data to influence planning and programming on a, on a very local scale. And then Bell, uh, Ben works for the federal government, and so his, his reach is much different. And what I'd like to start this discussion with is ask both of you, uh, Ben, your mic is off first, so I guess I'll ask you first. What do you think the value of locally collected data is at a federal level? Well, I think it's pretty obvious to, to yourself and everybody else, the more local you can get the, the information or the data, uh, the better it will be for whoever's going to be using the data. It can be from you know a recent example with with COVID and the experience of the last nearly two years and all the data that's been compiled everywhere or in an election campaign, say for example, if you're doing local polling and you get a sample size of three or 400 in a riding like here in Bruce, it should be very, very accurate. So the more local, the better. Um, and I, I, made a, I made a note earlier about the standard geographical classification and I think those are important too, because that really helps determine folks such as yourself and stats can determine rural, urban, and, and other uh, important information that policy holders, policy makers would be work thinking about. Okay, and Joel, the same question. How does uh, locally collected data at this level of granularity impact your organization or how can the data be used? Yeah, uh, I think the, the, the communities are just a hub of repository of data everywhere. So I think um, what's really, what's really uh, important for us is that a lot of the data that we try and collect at a, at a rural or individual municipal level is really difficult to get nationally. So um, when we are in absence of information, we have to make guesses and, and judgments on, on things. And I think that's where things get really difficult. So um, data is extremely important for decision makers right from, the, right from program and service delivery all the way up to policy um, and uh, funding decisions as well. It also helps us inform provincial and federal um, um, decisions as well, because in our, our rural context in particular, um, there's a lot of information that is different um, that not then from other uh, provincial or urban, more urban centered organizations. And for example, um, we see mental health addiction you touched on. Um, a, lot of, a lot of our ability to access services requires us to be mobile. So in a jurisdiction that has a high rate of um, elderly population or um, um, isolation factors, we, we, we can't get to some of those services that are an hour, hour and a half away. So in order for us to make the decision or to be able to contribute to the services that we need for the, for, for the uh, um, results in our population is that we have to know that in order to help direct provincial and federal level governments and or uh, decision, decision makers at the municipal levels. So it's critical for, for us to be able to be, to be um, in a position where we have a health a healthy uh, community. Okay, thanks. And uh, my next question then, oh, there's one in the question. Okay, so I'll jump. Anybody on the call who has questions, you can type it into the Q&A box. Uh, I think it's at the bottom of your screen, maybe. I think that's where it is. Uh, so from Amanda, it's great to see this project expanding. How do you see the remainder of rural Ontario benefiting from this work? Would it be through expansion of data collection to other communities, encouraging other communities to replicate this type of study? Or do you see the data you have being generally applicable to other non-participating regions? So I think that's a really interesting question, especially to someone who is originally from Northern Ontario. Amanda, I know that's where you are located as well. I have put in for a second research project that's not the same, but affiliated that has full endorsement from the Northern Policy Institute as a formal uh, partner. So there is expansion into the north. Um, when this project started, I mean, I got a lot of pushback and I think 
I don't know if I, I can't speak for Ben, but I don't know how often you end up in talks that it's paper surveys at this point. Almost everybody pushes electronic survey uh, distribution and collection of data. I push back very hard to try to, uh, to for the paper surveys because, I mean, as a lot of people know, broadband is unreliable in rural places. Uh, older residents tend to prefer paper and generally people prefer paper. So we received about 4,500 completed digital surveys. The remaining 24, 23,000 were all paper. So it was really interesting. So your question about expansion, it becomes an issue of money. Uh, postage is expensive. And that is where the over half of this budget went. It went towards paying for postage and paper. And there's arguments against that for sure. Uh, if I were to do it again, carbon, uh, carbon offset, offsets would be something I would look into trying to figure out how else we can do this. Uh, but at this point with the volume of data that we have, I'm going to try to engage with someone for stats to look at those predictive modeling opportunities because there's been such a volume of data that I think it could be used. Uh, before I go to the next question, I'm gonna jump back to Joelle and Ben. Uh, the question I had is about the relationship, Ben, I guess, between the federal government and local organization like Joelle's. How, do, uh, how does anyone on the call who might be affiliated with a local organization, how should they engage with the federal government? What's the best way to start that dialogue and that discussion? Well, it, it, it depends, because if you look at the United Way, uh, they're, a, they're a large organization and they have a, a national reach. And so they would have people that would converse with uh, the prime minister's office, different uh, ministers, and federally and provincially for that matter. And then also local outreach, like with Joel or Ryan through the years where they would call for an annual meeting or a meeting when it was necessary. And if you look at during the pandemic, obviously the United Way was used to deliver services because they are, uh, they do have a, a, a very local reach and mm -hmm. you can see how that relationship uh, can work and it works, you know, it doesn't matter what political stripe the government of the day is federally or provincially, uh, they have that relationship to do it. Um, others, if they're not quite as large as the United Way, they can contact myself, they can contact other members of parliament, uh, whoever they like, and we can work to do it. I, I can remember years ago with ALS, before the ice bucket challenge was the, was the big thing for a period of time, uh, we had a great working relationship out of my office with uh, ALS, and we're able to achieve some pretty significant uh, results in a federal budget in 2014 or 15. So really just depends. Thanks, Ben, I appreciate that. And Joelle, how, as I mean, Ben's right, the United Way is kind of an outlier because of its size, but because of its size, you work with a lot of smaller nonprofits. What is that relationship like? And do you end up being kind of a, like a liaison between smaller uh, organizations? And how do you find your data that you therefore, or that you then use to promote or advocate for something? Uh, the uh, we can be we can be um, a connector to uh, either either right from an individual to a needed service or from a not for profit to um, a, a cooperative uh, resource of some kind. So whether we're you know advocating around uh, you know food security or things like that to get those messages out, it's it's always better together when there's common issues of or common interest areas for sure. Um, I think um, you know part of what you're talking about is our our data is often siloed. So when we look at you know there's food there's food data um, and there's healthcare data and there's data in these silos. And so the the role that that I get to play in in the work that I do is trying to pull that data together and um, determine sort of where the needs are, where there's potential gaps where there's uh, duplication at times um, or, whether, or whether we need to advocate for um, policy changes or um, funding opportunities at any level of, of government um, and beyond, uh, quite frankly. So the, we have a MyPerth here website that 
collects that data. We're going through a bit of a revision right now, but there is that portal for us to be able to um, publicize the information that we do get. And so uh, in the next, um, um, by January, we'll have that new uh, version up and running, um, but it really does help our local um, not-for-profit organizations understand where services may be needed, where there's where there's opportunities, uh, things that they can maybe stop doing and collaborate with others or redirect their focus. Um, at times, it can act as a as a conduit to that information. So it, it can be very helpful, as well as grant writing and um, you know uh, annual report stuff as well. Yeah, thanks so much for that. I I would like to add one of the 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 most important outcomes of this research is is a recognized awareness of who's going through what. Um, I think we all have been having these conversations perhaps with our friends and families, you know, and we know that John from down the street is going through a rough time because, you know, maybe his daughter lost her job or uh, Mary from up the street, maybe she lost her job, something like that. And I think those are really important conversations, of course, to be had. The reality though is for most Canadians, unless you've accessed the system, you have no idea even where to look for help. And COVID has done a lot of things to a lot of people, but what it has unfortunately done is impact a group of people that have never really accessed the system before. I, I know that often they're referred to as newly vulnerable. I don't really like the term, but it what it means is that there's a group of people that previously have just been for all intents and purposes moving along finally, and something has happened that they just, for one reason or another, they need some help. Uh, if this project can be used just to inc wave the flag around mental health, decrease stigmatization, particularly for men in rural areas around the need for mental health support, then I'm completely on board for it. If the data can be used just to help create an, uh, an education campaign so the general population is more aware of what's out there. Um, I worked really hard on this project and I give all these talks because I really think it's critical that all people that I'm asking to participate know that I'm using the data back towards them. You know, there is a need for people to recognize that without their participation, it won't work. So the first question that was asked about who am I working with with the counties, it is a group of people. Uh, I engaged directly with county municipal government on all at all levels or at all counties. Uh, the reason is because I've, if I don't get that endorsement, I'm sort of dead in the water. So I engaged with individuals primarily from ECDEV because that's where I ended up. Uh, interacting with them. And then they engaged with a massive group from their specific county. So for example, Oxford County, uh, they ended up having 20, I think it was 24 groups that promoted the surveys within the county. And because of that, I think Oxford is going to end up with almost 6,000 responses. Oxford was really, really proactive about pushing us out. I say often that I can create you a survey, but I don't have the network to get it into the hands of people that I want to fill it out. So I worked in Huron and Perth with uh, both municipal or both, both county levels, all upper, all lower tier, every single lower tier municipality I interacted with. I gave talks to every council. I went to nonprofit organizations, food security places, the United Way, obviously, Salvation Army, as many people as I could or took my call. I also responded to every phone call myself. So it is, I mean, it is a pain for sure. And not everybody is super happy to get my survey, but I mean, I think one of the reasons why I want or I agreed to give this talk is just if there's anybody on the call that has been annoyed by my survey, then this I want to kind of clarify what the data is being used for that I'm not just holding it. This is not a government conspiracy. It literally is to gain information that services can benefit from. Uh, over time, rural medical services, especially hospitals, have been reduced, limited or closed. Are you seeing reflections on reduced mental health that align with the physical health consequences? What we are seeing is a decrease in overall mental and physical health, except the difference is much more drastic in mental health. The issue that I want to go further with around mental health uh, impact is what does mental health mean? So anyone who works in the field understands there's a significant difference between mental health and, a, and mental illness. I'm not certain that, that that's well recognized or understood across the public. So I would like to ask questions about mental health, addictions versus mental illness as well. Try to get to the bottom of that a little bit more. Uh, physical health implications, I'm getting people talk about uh, weight gain in particular, but physical health hasn't been discussed too much. In the expansion, I ask about alcohol uh, intake. 
uh, cannabis intake as well as opioid intake, trying to get uh, some information on that area as well. So at this point, I can't really speak too much about what those findings are because as I said, we're still uh, collecting all that information. Uh, multivariate analysis, yeah, okay, so predictive uh, modeling for cross-sectional data, it is really difficult. The reality is, though, that this is not going to be our last disruption. So I really, really hope that we don't have another mass global pandemic, but there will be more disruptions. And the more information we can gain from this current, I don't want to call it an opportunity, but this current opportunity, the better prepared we can be for future disruptions. So if we're able to get this information and use multivariate analysis to start to develop these models, anything, in my opinion, will make us better prepared moving forward so that we're not kind of stuck on our on our heels a little bit. Uh, there's been lots of criticisms leveled at all levels of government. Regardless of your political stripes, there wasn't a great playbook. You know, and I think I think everybody did the best they can. Of course, there's criticisms, but for the most part, uh, you know, Everybody did the best they could. Uh, I'd like to open up the floor a little bit to Joelle and Ben. Uh, ben, do you have anything to add or uh, anything you'd like to to bring up at this point? We've got about 15 minutes left. Well, one thing I would say is <clears throat> this could be a discussion for another day, probably an entire panel is around the future of, of the collection of data, knowingly and unknowingly. And so uh, there will be a bill presented to parliament likely in the new year on the digital charter and mm -hmm. this is to do partially to do with your data and who owns your data and who can use your data and how can they use your data mm -hmm. and if you look at the fang stocks with facebook amazon netflix google those types of things uh twitter they are yes we like to use it but every time you click the button they are collecting your data that's mm -hmm. their business and so it's no surprise when you go on your computer and you pop up and see a, a sports ad, that's because, you know, I'm looking at sports stuff or what have you. Uh, there's a reason why that is. And so um, there will be a big discussion about that. If you tie that into COVID times, I made a note here about the, uh, where did I put that? The mobility data. So the fact that the federal government purchases uh, your, your data from your mobile phone and it's all anonymous. Uh, that's what they say. And so the idea is, is if you, your primary place where you, where you sleep, they have that and then they track where you go through the day and try and make correlations between COVID and the spread of COVID. So these types of things, um, we hope that the federal government is using this in an ethical way. They're purchasing it from a third party, obviously through the, the cellular providers. But these are the types of things that need to be discussed in further detail in the digital charter. Like when you're doing your collection of data and when I've done it through the years through my own office, you're sending out a thing in the mail in an envelope and it's clearly stated who you are and what you're doing and the person can throw it in the recycling bin or send it to you. Mm -hmm. That's the best way. Uh, you probably get the best results that way too. The other stuff... I think is up for a larger debate. And I know it's a very, there are people that have very strong feelings about their personal data. Yeah. And I mean, I, I don't know if anybody noticed on that little video clip, but there's a wall that I've collected of letters that have come back and it's people that aren't super impressed that they're receiving a survey in the mail. And a lot of it is, if I were to summarize most of the feedback, it is what right do you have to collect my data? Um, and I think that is a, a really commonly held feeling for a lot of individuals, not just rural. So that is, that's, that's across all geographies. Um, I should have, I guess, say this, but the project did go through a full research ethics board review process. It has to be annually renewed. Uh, there is no identifiable information being collected other than uh, your geography. And that's not by postal code. It's just by uh, lower tier municipality. And you can also opt out of it, of course. So no question is mandatory. You can opt out of it. Um, so I understand people's hesitation sometimes because of exactly what you said, Ben, uh, about all of the, especially the negative information that is spread about what our data is being used for. But then I do receive comments being like, don't use a QR code because they're watching you through it. So it is, there is a need for a, an arm's length advocacy group that says this is what data does or this is how data is being collected so i'm not certain that the government should be that group but any effort to educate 
the public on what data is being used for, how it's being collected, I think is really, really valuable, especially in this time of high social media usage, tracking. I mean, if anybody on the call has been married recently, you had nothing but wedding dress ads for a really long time on your screen or rings or so forth. So they are watching for sure. Uh, if anybody has an Alexa at home, everything is kind of part of it, but you just have to be comfortable with what data is being used for. Um, Joelle mentioned, sorry, Joelle, I'll get you in a sec. You go ahead, Joelle, go. Oh, sorry, um, I, yeah, I think um, the one thing that's been really interesting in the process around this survey, Leith, in our relationship and helping the development of and, and uh, um, connections to the community partners and things like that. The, the thing that I think is so important for us to remember, especially in rural, um, is that we're giving information back. So we're not just taking it um, and doing something with it that we don't know. We're informing the public about what it is that the data is being collected for. But then of course, we're feeding it back and you listed all the ways in which you're doing that. I think that that's a critically important thing is that you don't just take the numbers and say, okay, see a leader. Um, this is what you've told us by the information that you've provided to us. So that there's that sort of better sense of, um, you know, this is about you for you, as opposed to we're taking, 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 and we just don't know what's happening with that. And so I think that that's been done exceptionally well here. And that's the real important piece I, I know from us and I'm sure from Gateway is the, the connection to our academic institutions or our, or our research partners in making sure that our data is responsible to the local need that we have here. Um, the other thing I'm just going to maybe, uh, you know, going to pass it back to you in a second, Lisa, but um, is talking about the need for us to have a rural um, portal of data. So how do we, when we don't necessarily, because our population bases are so small, it doesn't get collected in stats scan data per se or other, other data sets, how do we get access to our own information? And so part of that is we have incredible partners locally for social research and planning to get those. We're always open to more partnerships around understanding and getting data and being a contributor of um, data. So it, it's about that, that uh, you know, we're doing it with our communities to, to get the, the data and be able to display it in a way in which it was meant to be displayed. And so we need our community partners wherever that data is coming from. But um, also, you know, just talk a little bit about maybe that rural portal uh, of data or of some kind, because we've learned a lot from the my proof here and evolution to um, and the need for that accessibility to local rural data. Yeah, okay. So I, Joel knows, we've talked about this before, but I one of these uh, applications that I've submitted to the provincial government is saying that at that point, say I will have 25,000, maybe 30,000 completed surveys. It, to my knowledge, is the largest collection of rural data that has happened in the province of Ontario. And I, I, I at this level of granularity in a really long time, if ever, um, I am proposing the need for a national repository on data that's been collected in small and rural towns. I don't know how that works. I'm not a, I don't know how all that works, but I'm into collecting data. And the idea would be that it would be available. Of course, the, the risk of collecting data like this is it requires upkeep. So there's so many data repositories that die because their funding runs out. So it is about securing funding and that funding probably has to come from the federal government. Sorry, Ben. Uh, but it has to be something that is secure enough that says almost like almost like a census. This is still what's going on. This is what's relevant. And as everyone knows, COVID has exacerbated a lot of the issues that everybody already knew existed in rural places. Cost of living, of course, that's been something that's discussed in urban places, but we are seeing migration within the province of Ontario from the GTA outside that we've never seen before. That implication for rural and small communities is very, very important to explore and have data about. There's a question on there about food security. All of this data does uh, can be cross-tabulated to look at something like food concerns. So I don't call it food security in the survey. I just call it anxiety around uh, food availability uh, because we wanted to make sure that everything was accessible without using any sort of triggering language. So I am able to do any cross-tabulations like that. Uh, Joel's heard me say this before, I'm not an advocate, it's not what my job is, but I do collect data that uh, groups that are advocates can use. So I am very comfortable flipping data back to people in a non-identifiable uh, way that they can use to make their argument for whatever the case is that they need. 
Grace Brew, uh, Gray Bruce, I wondered whether the work you've done has been used uh, as a comparator with other areas which share the same. Okay, so in the expansion in total, there'll be nine counties across Ontario. So there are lots of similarities uh, across rural, area, rural areas. There's lots of differences, but because of the type of survey that we ran, we're able to do really great comparisons between different regions. So I'm I shouldn't say I'm super comfortable saying that I can do it, but I'm pretty comfortable saying that we'll be able to do full comparisons between different areas. Uh, availability of internet connections in the cost of equipment. Of course there is. I mean, I am someone who advocates uh, that internet is almost a basic right at this point. You want people to have economic stability, economic access, and you don't provide, uh, you know, affordable broadband. You're, it, it's necessary at this point. So I absolutely think that it's, it's really, really critical. Uh, not a question, comment. Oh yes, I already read that. I'm sorry that I turned on your Alexa speaker when I said her name. I teach nursing at Conestoga and I'm always on the lookout for rural data to properly care for people in our rural populations. We need to have knowledge about their strengths and their needs. Rural nursing and health is very different than urban, yet the latter makes up most of the profession's knowledge base. Absolutely. Where are, um, where are nurses trained? Where, do, where are schools located? All of it is in by almost across the board in urban places. The University of Guelph and the program that I teach in is one, is the only rural planning program in the country. And that's what makes us pretty unique. Uh, we do have an explicit focus on rural Canadians and their interests. So I would really ask if anybody's on the call that has an area that you think should be focused in, or you have a need for data like this, uh, reach out to me anytime. I'm happy to have those conversations. Um, just seeing if there's any more questions. I think that's about it. Paul, if you want to jump back on. There we are. Uh, yeah, and before Paul says anything, I'd like to personally thank Joel and Ben for participating today. Ben, I know you're, you're a busy guy, and I know, Joel, you're very, very busy today in particular, so I really appreciate you guys taking uh, the hour to participate today. Great. Thanks, Paul. Great. Thanks, Leith. Uh, thanks, Ben. Thanks, Joel. Uh, wonderful conversation and discussion. Um, uh, Leith, you, uh, you juggled those comments and questions really, really well, and I think got to everyone. Um, the, uh, the attendees certainly were interested in the conversation that was going on, um, as witnessed by the, uh, the number of questions that came and comments, so thank you. Um, the, when you think, when I think about data, I think about it's really a light being shone oftentimes on areas and information that wouldn't necessarily be seen before. And clearly you've demonstrated in this presentation, uh, light being shone. And all three of you, uh, the question that comes to my mind often is in two parts when I see data. So what, uh, and now what? And I think uh, all three of you have done a really good job of, of answering those types of questions. And, and I thank you. Um, Leith, a, a really big thank you for creating this conversation as, as we said around this topic and, uh, and Joelle and Ben for sharing your insights. Also wanna take this opportunity to thank our sponsors. Uh, they are Bruce Power, Larry Otten Contracting, CIBC Private Wealth Management, Tajager Town Square IDA Pharmacy, the Town of Godrich and Godrich Zayers. Thanks for your continued support. Without you, this lecture series would not be possible. Gateway Center of Excellence in Rural Health is a not-for-profit organization with charitable status, and we greatly appreciate and welcome the support we receive. Lastly, thank you again to all the attendees for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you at the next lecture series that kicks off in 2022. Feel free to share this information with your networks to expand the reach of these lecture series with the aim to promote the knowledge economy, reduce social isolation, and support Gateway's mission of improving the health and quality of life for rural residents. Enjoy the remainder of your day, and for now, goodbye from Gateway. Thanks, all. Thank you.